Good day and welcome to today's episode of The Square. I am not Brandon Carmichael. My name is Adam Flaw. This handsome devil next to me is Dylan Wells. And joining us all the way from Avila, Spain, is Manuel Jimenez Garcia with Nagami to talk all things 3D printing. So here we go. Well, welcome, Manuel. I hope you're doing well today. Yeah. Hello. How are you? Doing uh, good. Doing guys. good. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to jump right in here and I'm going to start with tell us who you are, how you knew you wanted to become an architect, your career path, and how that led to the formation or the creation of Nagami. Okay, that's uh, compressing uh, 25 years in uh, five minutes. <laughs> Uh, well, okay, starting from the beginning, um, I didn't really know I wanted to become an architect. I wanted to be a doctor. And, and then things, things went, um, went to a different path and I started to realize that uh, I was very good at that understanding how things were coming together. And I, I like buildings, I like design, I like graphic design, I like furniture. And in the end, I just decided for architecture. Um, but I've, I've always been a bit of a, of a nerd. So I'm very passionate about technology, uh, since I was a kid. Um, so, so the more I got into architecture, the more I thought, uh, that it would be good to start introducing, um, you know, the digital world more deeply in, into architecture. Uh, so from kind of a second, second year at uni, uh, I started learning 3D modeling software and, um, and rendering and so on. Like back in those days, that was more used in, in animation, movies and so on. Um, so then I decided to go way deep, uh, way uh, deeper um, into that and, and move to London after I, I graduated from Madrid uh, to study a, a master's in, in computational architecture, digital architecture at the, at the AA, the Architectural Association. Um, so there, um, I thought that digital architecture was, um, belonging much more to whatever you see in the, in the screen. Right. But, uh, um, back in 2009, when I was studying, um, we started to see some examples of, of, uh, machines that can be tweaked to the positive material, to, to, uh, CNC material. I started to get like my first, um, kind of uh, connections with, with 3D printing, very small <laughs> 3D printing, right? Um, that was what, what was available. And, and then a few years later, when I, after I graduated, I started uh, running a, a research lab at the, at the bar of the School of Architecture, uh, after being teaching also a few years at the, at the AA. Um, and then uh, I decided to, to focus um, the, the research of the lab on um, making a, a new step in architecture where uh, machines and automation would help us build uh, faster, um, more efficiently, um, more affordably, more sustainably, um, and also uh, in a different way, right? Like to create a completely different nature in the world of of, of design and, and, and architecture, right? Um, so back in those days, uh, me and my, and my partners, uh, we had um, a small robot in university. Uh, so we started playing with the students, uh, uh, seeing how we can print larger, right? Um, so we started modifying uh, the, the, the nozzles and the extruders, right? Like taking them apart from, a, from desktop 3D printers and adapting them to the robot so that we will have a, a, a larger bounding box, right? That we can print a little bit larger. And then uh, to another robot uh, that we purchased that year uh, to print even larger, right? And then we needed to print thicker, right? Uh, so that we would print faster, right? So uh, things to start to, to scale up and, and the research was very well uh, accepted in, in, in the world of, you know, di digital design and uh, let's call it also technology applied to, to architecture. Um, so in 2016, uh, we got, uh, we were approached by the, the center Pompidou to create, um, 
uh, a piece for the permanent collection and for a large exhibition uh, called uh, Printing the World. Right? Um, so back in the days, um, I had to make a decision on how to how to make that piece possible, right? I, I didn't know yet how the piece would look like, um, but I, I knew I had two years um, and it was a, a great opportunity to not only create that piece, uh, but also create the first steps of something that could evolve towards making uh, 3D printing furniture and beyond um, a reality. Uh, there were very few examples of, of that scale um, in, in 3D printing, right? Uh, so it was really experimental. It is still experimental today, but um, back in, in, in 2015, 2015, 2016, um, it, it was really something that people would not conceive, right? Um, so then uh, um, I thought, well, rather than doing it as a university research, let's take the risk, uh, convince my, my brother and, and, um, and a very good friend of mine, uh, who is now my third partner in the company, um, get a, a second-hand robot, put it in my hometown, back in Spain, um, spend two years of our life uh, designing a, a tool that could actually extrude plastic, right? Like, so three architects really working on a technology that we were really not related to and, um, and creating a, a, a code uh, that would allow us to materialize a, a design from the computer uh, to... Um, uh, the physical reality uh, using our tech and, uh, and an industrial robot. Man, you uh, you did an amazing job of covering <clears> twenty five <throat> years in uh, fewer than five minutes. That 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 really that truly is a rich picture. Uh, so when it comes to Nagami, uh, tell us tell us a little bit about the company and and what you do specifically there. Well, so um, Nagami is. It's actually ma mainly a design brand, uh, but that specifically works with uh, recycled plastics uh, in large scale 3D printing, right? So we have industrial robots. Uh, right now we have um, seven and we're actually looking at um, extending it with another uh, 25 um, in a few months from now, which is exciting. And so what we do is we take recycled plastic, uh, we mix it with uh, colorants, uh, we treat it right. Um, we get it through the extruder that we, we develop. So it gets uh, hit up right? and, and then gets deposited layer by layer or even printed in the air. Right? Um, and to, to make that possible, uh, we develop the uh, different parts of, uh, or pieces of software right? um, that allow us to communicate very smoothly with the, with the with our our um, uh, machines, right? Uh, with with our uh, extruder, and um, and also let us uh, simulate and evaluate the, the designs that we do, uh, so that uh, they are three D printable, right? Like, like they can actually um, uh, appear in the in, in real life, you not know, through through our tech. You know? Um, so we, we developed a, a very smooth workflow uh, between the design we do, uh, which sometimes also happens in, in collaboration with other designers, um, the, the, the software that kind of rationalizes it and, and makes sure this can uh, really come to life, and the hardware which uh, makes it a reality. Well, that's uh, the right. particular particularly the aspect about uh, the recycled plastic. We'll come back to that because we've got some questions about sustainability later. But so for somebody like me, because Dylan here, the uh, he's the expert in the room uh, on our side. Um, I am just a buffoon in front of a camera. So for a simpleton such as myself, give me just what the very basic definition of 3d printing is i mean to just tell me at the, at the very base level when you're describing it to say a fifth grader what what does that what is that <laughs> okay so um if the question is what what is what is 3d printing yeah um, just that it's yeah. very mo at its most basic level what is 3d printing yeah. believe it or not this is the very first time I get asked that question. <laughs> what is fundamentally at a basic level 
uh, 3D printing. Um, well, I mean, 3, 3D printing is, um, is making material to deposit in, in the three dimensions uh, to create a physical form, right? Um, and then I, I, I could go a little bit more technically. There, there are many different ways of, uh, of 3D printing, but the most common one is, is actually, is based on a very simple concept, right? You can get any object in the world and slice it into like two dimensional drawings, right? Like, like if I, I can get this, this uh, microphone right now and, um, and cut it with, um, a hundred, uh, different layers, right. And each of those will have a form, right. So you can describe that way, any physical form. Um, FDM 3D printing, which is what we use is taking every one of those layers and convert them into material, right? So you pour material, um, following the path of the first layer, go up, um, you take the second layer and follow that different path. And by combining all those many different paths together, uh, you, um, uh, get a, a resulting, uh, three dimensional object. Okay. Dylan, I'm going to, I'm going to fully confess here. Dylan was embarrassed by that question and he probably should be cause he knows all about it. Uh, but I, that that's actually, that's really, really fascinating. Cause I thinking of 3d printing, it's like, okay, well you 3d print an object, but the way you, you describe it there is breaking it down into a number of layers of two dimensional layers that you form together. If I'm understanding that correctly, that you put together, that creates a 3d object and then you print out of that, that you can you can articulate any object that way. That's, that's pretty fascinating. All right, Manuel, now that you've explained the basics of 3d printing, which any uh, high school aged individual would likely know the answer to that question. Well, that's, that's really um, uncalled for, uncalled for. Uh, can you, can you explain, I, I'm going to go in two directions here. One more kind of, you've, you've given us a background of what's led you here and just the experimentation uh, that it took and you know taking kind of typical three axis cartesian 3d print methods and making them you know uh or driving them more with robotics things like that really doing a lot of extensive material testing i can imagine but can you can you talk to what your experimental process looks like not only at nagami but before when you were testing a lot of things you know at a university level um, what does it look like to be kind of pioneering something that there really aren't a lot of precedents for and figuring out, you know, a lot of workarounds and how do we actually make that into a production workflow, those kind of things, just the difficulty of going on something that's a somewhat new endeavor and how much experimentation, trial and error needs to feed into that process. Well, that's a, that's a very good question, actually, because, um, so most people believe, I mean, outside the circle, right? But uh, most people believe that 3D printing is this magical tool that can materialize in thin air, absolutely any form, right? Um, and in a record time. Um, the reality is that, I mean, 3D printing, like any other uh, manufacturing uh, technology, uh, requires a lot of uh, setup and, and prototyping uh, when you are uh, creating a specific piece, right? Um, so yes, you have much more freedom in terms of the, the shapes that you, that you can create than any other technology. Like you don't have to demold, right? Um, you don't have to, um, you know, deal with most of the restrictions that you, you find in, in traditional manufacturing. Um, but at the same time, you have to, you need that virtuosity at uh, controlling, you know, when, when a, lay a layer is doable or not, right? Uh, when the material is going to fall, uh, when the material weight is going to be too much. So the object will deform, right? When the planarity of an object, for example, will, will start, uh, deforming, uh, certain areas, uh, because of, uh, of the material getting colder, right? And dissipating heat, right? So, all those uh, aspects uh, need to be tested out um, before the creation of a, any of the objects we, we do. Now. When we, we started uh, challenging the, the two-dimensionality of the, 
of uh, the, the traditional 3D printing technique, right? That I was mentioning before. So you get an object, you, you cut it in flat um, uh, two-dimensional uh, toolpaths, and then you put it together. Um, with robots and, and having seven uh, axis machines, um, the, the lines could actually um, kind of be choreographed in, in three dimensions, right? Um, we developed a system so that you can print a, a line with a differentiated thickness. So you can go very, very thin and then very, very thick. Like let's say from uh, half a millimeter to nine or 10 millimeters, right? So, so that that ledges are actually then described in three dimensions rather than uh, in, in pure uh, um, uh, X and Y, right? Um, so to, to make that a reality and produce an object of a high quality, uh, to have each line to be <laughs> exactly what it needs to be without the formation, with the thickness that it needs to, so that the, the overall object is described in a certain shape, required like, loads and loads and loads of prototyping. And it still does. Um, every new project we do has a, a, a part for uh, for prototyping that object. Sometimes we believe that within the range of possibilities that we know we can manage. Sometimes even for you know one thing or another, it fails, right? And you you get material dropping, and then you need to start again, and you need to evaluate it, right? Um, when we started the, the very first project we did, which was the this Pompidou chair called the the voxel chair. Um, because we were very concerned with the printing time, and uh, and one of the most frustrated things in in three uh, D printing is that perhaps you are actually printing an object um, for twenty hours, and at the very end it fails, you know? and then you want to cry. So because I, I cried <laughs> many times with traditional like a smaller three D printers, right? Like after ten hours, it's like okay, this is just. Uh, completely useless. No? Uh, we designed a system um, that was based on prototyping just one single line fra uh, fragment, right? And then the object will be based on that that, that same uh, line fragment repeated all over, right? Um, and even if this is a, a, a very specific project, uh, this is conceptually incredibly interesting for the world of 3D printing. Because if you prototype that line fragment in every uh, possible rotation and every possible connection to an identical line fragment, right? You make sure that whatever you print afterwards is doable, right? It's not going to fail. Um, that was fundamental for us in the, in the project. So this issue of, uh, of um, efficiency um, has always been very important for us from the very beginning. Also because we knew after that project, if, if we want to really, uh, you know, create furniture or create interiors or facades or even architecture, and we want to sell it, right? You can't spend months and months and months at failing prints and, and prototyping, right? So we always um, kind of think about uh, the, the prototyping phase, what it's going to take and how we can streamline it so that we guarantee a good result when it goes into production. No, I think that's uh, very interesting that you pointed out because I think when we a lot of people think about machines or um, you know 3D printing and robots, they think, oh, we just go up to the machines, we hit play, and then it just does its thing perfectly every time with you know few uh, flaws or faults in the whole system. When you know, just as you described, that's completely untrue. You know, there's many things that we still have to be observing, changing code, uh, worldly parameters that you didn't plan for that mess up the whole system or thing. So it's it's still a very uh, engaging process with the person driving the machines or going through that digital fabrication process. One thing that I that I'm curious is, you know, when you have a new job or you're trying to form find some design, you know, with additive manufacturing, it has so many beneficial shapes or material optimizing or structural optimizing that you can really derive from the additive manufacturing process. So I'd ask, um, one, how have you seen since you have entered this space, you know, how do you really derive form from the design? Because you, it's almost sky's the limit to a degree. There are parameters 
and things that you'll follow, but you know, you can really do complex organic shapes. And then two, in the prototyping process, I'm just curious for my own uh, personal knowledge, do you still have like smaller desktop you know, printers or things like that, that you print test ideas quickly at scale to test out almost like mini prototypes in the process? Okay, so, um, well, to answer the first question, uh, I mean, after quite a few years doing this, um, every single line we draw, uh, every single surface we describe, every vertex we move, I do have the constraints of 3D printing in mind. Right. Um, so we design really from 3D printing. Um, and that is something that we, we learn through, through the effort, through sweating, through mistakes. Right. Um, but, but now, um, I think even if we always want to, or, uh, to push it to the limit, right. Um, we have in mind what is possible and, and what is not. Yet, um, to, to play within the threshold of, uh, of what can be printable or not, right? Um, we uh, simulate the, the material, right? So um, we develop a few pieces of software that, that does that, yeah? Um, and then we prototype it, right? Um, we don't use a smaller 3D printers. First, uh, first of all, because even if you can tweak a 3D printer and we've done it to print uh, thicker so that is more or less equivalent to a scaled down version of the real object. Uh, the parameters, the way the material behaves uh, is completely different, but also because um, with our technology, with uh, our robotic 3D printed technology, uh, we will print much faster, right? So it is actually the real object, but it's also way faster to the point that the uh, uh, 3D printing a, a, a small model like this big of a, of a chair, um, takes around eight to 10 hours in a desktop, uh, 3d printer. And we print the real chair with our robots in three to four hours. Right. Uh, so it's for us actually a much more efficient method, um, to not print scale models, uh, but just print parts of, uh, of, uh, what the, the real object will be like. Uh, also, I think, I think it's important to, to mention there when you, uh, because we, we do collaborate with, a, with a, a very good designers, um, but, but we're very selective there, right? So we receive uh, lots of requests um, sending us a, a 3D file, like an OBJ or an STL, saying, hey, can you print that? It's like, well, um, this is, we, we are not a 3D printing service, also because most of, uh, of those uh, uh, OBJs that we receive are actually impossible to materialize. So yes, you have much more freedom, but um, you still need uh, uh, to deal with gravity. <laughs> and, uh, and that makes <clears throat> many of the shapes that we receive uh, impossible. Right? The way we work with others uh, is always having a very fluent communication from the beginning. We love working with designers that understand the technology. Um, that's why we launched the company with uh, Ross Lovecroft, Saha Hadid, uh, Daniel Widrick, um, designers that are really embedded in the world of, digital, of the digital, right? Uh, that understand what we can materialize smoothly and how to push that a little bit farther, right? And, and through those conversations that we have uh, with, with designers who are uh, flexible enough uh, to adapt our technology to their shapes, right? That's where the the, the object be becomes uh, real in a, in such a magical way, right? Um, so summarizing that to work with some uh, with someone, yeah, we we need to make sure that 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 someone is as flexible as we are <laughs> adapting, you know, our technology to, to fulfill a specific design, uh, they need to also adapt their design to, to um, work with our technology smoothly. In terms of uh, you bringing up partnerships and the people that you seek to have those partnerships with the designers and stuff, um, I'm curious if you could just talk about, <clears throat> you know, how has so far, I mean, especially being from the, um, architecture world and background, how do you think the industry thus far has responded to some of the 3D printed one-to-one -one architectural elements that we're seeing, you know, whether it be kind of the stuff that y'all 
are entering into with, you know, chairs, furniture, interior components. Um, I've seen some cool stuff, even the background of your shop that y'all are doing uh, from our previous talks. And, you know, with things like 3D printed concrete in the building world, just I'm curious to know from your perspective, being on the fabricator side of this emerging technology and how it's filtering um, in our industry, do you feel like the industry thus far has responded well or more hesitant? Are we kind of like on the cusp of all this stuff taking off or where do you see kind of the industry in light of all this digital fabrication going on? Well, um, I mean, I, I've been lucky enough to see the evolution of the industry for the last uh, decades in adopting technology, right? And um, of course, uh, it was taking a risk um, back in, let's say, 2013. Uh, it's still taking a risk uh, today just because um, embedding a, an experimental technology uh, within a, a process that, that, you, that you know it works well, right? As difficult, no? um, so um, you know many uh, many uh, companies, fabricators, architects, contractors, etc., um, are very reticent to to uh, use the, these technologies in in the objects that they they make every day. Uh, but they they are becoming more and more not only interested but uh, but risk takers um, uh, also. Not only for the because of the possibilities that 3D printing brings, um, but also uh, because of the sustainable aspect. Right? Um, I think if, if we talk a little bit about uh, plastics and, and sustainability, like just going back to the the fifties and sixties, um, architects were designing and producing uh, plastic bubbles where we were living. Right, like um, you know, the Futura House, for example, or the Smithsons. It's a, they they were creating architecture out of plastic. Uh, but in the '90s, when we become aware of, uh, of the problem of uh, plastic pollution, right, that dream closes off, yeah? and and then it's all about uh, products from the industrial revolution, like steel, uh, uh, reinforced concrete, etc. And and that is what kind of empowers. Uh, the modernist movement to to go ahead and 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 leave all these you know crazy plastic bubbles uh, in the back, right? Um, today uh, we can work with plastic uh, not only in a sustainable manner, right? Um, but actually, like in increasing the demand for uh, utilizing plastic waste, right? In a, in an industry um, like construction and architecture, right, is what will make that waste to disappear faster from the planet, right? So I think recovering that, that kind of willingness to experiment on, on a new future, on new spaces where we can live in, uh, but at the same time using a material that is right now, unfortunately, unlimited in the world. There, there is eight times more weight in plastic waste than in people. Yeah, and and that is rapidly increasing. Um, so um, it's not only that we we need to uh, find um, like solutions on you know creating new materials that replace plastic. Is that that plastic is there, right? We need to do something with it, right? Um, and that is uh, encouraging um, like lots of uh, uh, brands and, and companies to yeah take the risk, yeah but um, make their own contribution, uh, start changing their, their production line, it's, it's start changing how, um, how they are facing the new world, right? Uh, like now we're working with, you know, brands like uh, Christian Dior, or we, we're working with a, a few others that I can't mention right now, but, uh, but stay tuned for next month, um, that are like creating their window, not only their window displays, but also the entire uh, shop out of uh, uh, recycled plastic. And, and that we, we offer later a service to, if it's a temporary installation, to take it, chop it, right, recycle it, and uh, reutilize it. No? So I, I think working more sustainably, um, I mean, for us as, as designers and as, as fabricators is, is just an obligation. No, it's, it's not an option. It's, we, we have to do it. And uh, as we have to, I think the, the biggest players in, in the industry 
should actually move fast into this territory because those will be the ones that make a, a much wider effect. So to bring it back to uh, the layperson uh, zone, which is this guy right here, um, I want to talk a little bit about the the you were talking about being selective with designers and complexity of design. And it sounds like you're selective of designers because it can get very complex and you want to make sure you're working with somebody that knows what they're doing. Uh, but to boil this down, what can you 3D print? And maybe a better question is, what can't you 3D print at this stage in the game? Hmm. That's a, that's a good question. Um, See, I've got I've got one or two in there. <laughs> I've got one or two. Yes. What can we three D print? Is is this? I don't know if uh, like we can answer as uh, you know. I I can answer as myself right now, and I could tell you what I can do and what I can't. Uh, but I'm not sure how to answer as um, myself in five years, right? And not only myself, but the entire industry. Um, look, 3D printing is still incredibly uh, experimental at this scale, right? Um, that's why there, there are not so many companies doing this kind of work. And as uh, 3D printing concrete is, uh, is actually evolving at a very fast pace uh, because of uh, you know, obvious implications in the speed of uh, construction, right? And, and can actually reduce cost. Um, plastic um, is... It's kind of taking all the part of the market and is is growing at a different at a different pace. Um, right now, I think we've we've demonstrated and and not only us, right, that you can sit in a three D printed chair and that that's becoming normal, right? Um, we can have three D printed um, panels for interiors. That's again normal. Um, there are three D printed facades, three D printed ceilings, right? Um, but I think the opportunities are so vast. And uh, once we, we, we master not only the techniques and the design that we can do, but also the material itself, like, um, you can combine recycled plastics with carbon fiber, with fiberglass, with, with cork, with, with coffee grains, right? That, that you can actually get different properties. Um, it's, this is kind of a starting to open the door to, to uh, create new behaviors in the parts that we print, right? Navigating towards uh, 3D printing actual architecture, right? Uh, we have a few projects that are um, taking the plastic as, as a structural, right? At an architectural scale, medium architecture or a small architecture, but it does work structurally, right? And, and there are compounds that you can, you can use uh, to respond against fire and so on. We've integrated uh, um, mechanisms in, in the prints. Um, like for example, I, I do believe that, that if, if, if I'm wrong, please someone email me, but I hadn't seen any uh, plastic 3D printed door before we, we made it. So I think we made the first um, 3D printed door. Um, also the very first 3D printed portable toilet. <laughs> so, but, but to actually uh, create those objects no? and like, you start realizing that first of all, 3D printing is not that magical, right? Like you need to like work on so many aspects, but um, you need to integrate all the materials. You need to have parts that move, right? Uh, parts that are like waterproof um, um, and that are like sealed. And, and so all those aspects require a lot of investigation. And, and that we are doing with, with a small uh, projects that we take as tests um, but each of those are um, kind of getting the purpose of, you know, solving small questions in what could become a, a 3D printed plastic building, right? Um, which I really do think that we will we will uh, see in in the coming years um, emerging and taking a part of the of the market of uh, construction. Um, I think the the, the best. Uh, kind of arena where um, 3D printing uh, should operate uh, is actually in buildings and more specifically in housing, right? To make housing more sustainable, but also when this process becomes more and more efficient, uh, it could also become uh, cheaper and faster, right? And that is where the real potential of, of uh, 3D printing uh, is. 
Um, we've been uh, working in projects and, and, you know, other companies as well, working for uh, like our special um, objects, like printing parts for planes, for cars, right? Um, we will see this applied more and more and more uh, in the coming years. And, uh, and the way the, the like material scientists are uh, developing new, new methods for dealing with uh, the cycle plastic is incredible. So I think in the future, we will probably be able to print almost anything. Uh, we will also be able to print multi-materials, right? Uh, with like dual nozzles and so on. Um, we are still far from it. Yes. Uh, but our steps are, um, I think, in the in the right direction. So, man, well, that's interesting, and I want to expand along that same lens. So, I know Nagami is really doing a lot of things three D print wise and exploring what that endeavor looks like. I'm just curious, currently or in the future, do you all also have plans to incorporate and leverage robotics for subtractive manufacturing? So, like milling, routing, or even looking at um, how robots can begin to assemble and fabricate um, componentry at high tolerances, you know, kind of running through almost the whole fabrication or even construction process and how robots feed into those various aspects? Or are is it really just we're focused and running towards 3D printing, what we can do, what are the potentials, that kind of thing at Nagami? Yeah. Um, so... Actually, the like Nagami comes from a wider uh, body of, of research uh, that we were very interested on in, in the research lab um, that included all kind of robotic manufacturing, uh, mainly focusing on uh, on two different areas. Uh, one is larger scale three D printing, and the other one is uh, robotic assembly. And uh, actually, we created a spin off company uh, from that called uh, Automated Architecture, right? Um, that is actually working on the uh, like prefabricated housing based on a single module that is uh, robotically assembled. Right? Um, there is uh, a lot of opportunities for robots to uh, operate in prefabrication and also on site, right? To make assemblies uh, faster, more efficient, more efficient, and more importantly, safer. Right? Uh, we are not made to build skyscrapers ourselves. Right, like uh, having a human in a in a fifty uh, um, story building on the top, just hanging from a beam, is actually not our natural uh, habitat, <laughs> right? And um, I I do think that the the contribution that robots and automation can make in in the area of construction are huge, right? Um, we do need a lot of development in terms of the the like robotic to uh, technology to make that efficient. Uh, but at least as, at a, a smaller scale, like what we are doing at our in in in, in housing, right, um, is is really throwing like new opportunities and new adventures uh, that architecture will definitely embrace. I think um, like you can start, you know, uh, be much more efficient with uh, material supplies, with uh, packing and shipping, right? Like if, if you have modular systems that can be automatically assembled on site in a matter of days and create create a, um, a housing block, right? Or, or it, I think that uh, brings in, like amazing opportunities, not only to, to construction, to design, to, to architecture, but, but also for uh, making housing more accessible. Right. Um, so I think you, you are hitting a good nail there. It's just uh, robotic assembly um, is, an, uh, is right now is starting to be and will definitely be a key player in, in new paths for, for architecture. It has been uh, for quite a while in uh, different projects for, uh, for space uh, colonization, right? So, you know, if we, we are building in, in Mars, right, or in the space, um, we don't want to send like uh, 500 humans to be um, putting together different pieces, right? But you want to automate that process, right? Um, and there are different research paths, uh, <clears throat> that are working uh, towards not only 3D printing with robots with uh, local materials, right? With local soil, um, but also to have robots assembling uh, modular parts to create shelters for uh, astronauts and, and to implement different kind of spaces. So I think that is definitely a key area for exploration. 
In Nagami, uh, we are focusing right now on 3D printing and we will incorporate uh, more materials as long as uh, those are uh, sustainable, right? Um, and, but we need to, you know, you need to, you need to pick your fights, right? And right now, you know, the, the company is growing, uh, but it's, it's good that we have, we have that main focus. We have also done a lot of uh, uh, CNC and actually uh, we still do. Uh, some of the, the um, objects that we make are uh, then afterwards uh, CNC to create, to mechanize parts and, and like uh, create holes, connections, etc. And we've also worked um, in university at um, like uh, subtractic uh, manufacturing, right? Like CNC uh, with robotics. And one of our core principles in Nagami is only use the material we need to use and that's why we uh, are very passionate about uh, additive manufacturing more than uh, in substructive manufacturing uh, but still um, the combination of both becomes very very powerful for some of the objects we do so with that let's jump back into the uh dumb zone with yours truly where does the where does the design process intersect with 3D printing and and where would you like to see it or where do you see it in impacting architecture in 20 years? So, well, um, 3D printing um, really comes from, from digital design, right? So they go hand by hand. Um, there would not be 3D printing uh, without digital design. Right, and um, so uh, starting obviously because you you need a, a three dimensional model uh, to then print afterwards, right? And the advances in um, in uh, uh, digital design uh, have been incredible in the last few years, and especially now seeing AI coming into play, right? Uh, that this is still operating mainly at a two dimensional level, but uh, it's becoming more and more clever, right? And and I think very soon when we start to see um you know machines creating digital shapes three-dimensionally that are already incorporating some of the constraints and the opportunities of 3d printing right that's going to be a game changer right um until now it's it's just been um pretty much highly connected to to the designer uh, modeling something in the computer and and then uh, rationalizing it, transforming it to, uh, into data uh, so that uh, it can get to a 3D printer or, or, or to a robot. But I, I think that process is going to get much more compact. Uh, like we will very soon um, design things that are automatically almost being printed, right? Like like not generating a large set of data, but actually that data being um, you know, smoothly transition to a machine as, as that machine is depositing material to turn it into a reality, right? Um, so I think that that's kind of one of the futures of, uh, of design in, in 3D printing. Um, also, uh, for us and, and I guess for many uh, kind of digital designers or uh, designers specialized on, on 3D printing, um, introducing... Um, uh, computer programming to our discipline um, has been uh, uh, extremely key, right? Uh, like I learned how to how to program in 2009, um, just because I was incredibly interesting, but also uh, to start working on on systems and protocols rather than on fixed designs, right? To see how design can evolve, uh, how you design a software that design uh, objects for you. Right, uh, rather than just designing the object directly, so that has uh, opened uh, like a, a, a vast array of, of possibilities for for design. Uh, but it it has also made us closer to um, to machines somehow. Right, like uh, we can communicate with the machine much better than before because we know computer programming, right? And, and we, we understand how the machine works because we already use some of those aspects in um, our own uh, design strategies, right? Um, so I think we, we, we've, we've seen an evolution in design, in, especially in the last decade. Um, 
uh, where uh, now the role of the architect or the designer has changed. We've entered other territories and those, those new territories are expanding um, our ideas for uh, what kind of shapes and spaces we can create. And Manuel, with that same trajectory in mind of what you just laid out, um, I'm just curious to see what your response would be to the naysayers, if you will, that when they encounter these technologies, just the word robotics, I know we were talking about Tron and the Matrix earlier, but what, what would be your response to the people who are, you know, say this is going to take jobs away, this is going to, you know, the robot's going to replace me and my family or, you know, all that kind of almost dystopian like uh, future of, of new technologies. What would be your response to, to those notions? Yeah. Um, well, we're talking about the industry 4.0 now, and um, but but in, in, in that there's still the word industry, right? And the, there are other like 3, 3.0, 2.0, 1.0, right? So industry has been um, going through um, through an evolution, right? Um, from the very beginning, and and robots are are nothing new. Um, what we understand as the first robot is the washing machine. The washing machine let us not having to go to the river to wash clothes. And um, and yes, yeah, so those going to the river to wash clothes, then they were actually operating the machines, being more efficient. Um, there they were other kind of uh, positions created that were connected to technology, right? So I don't think robots are taking jobs away. Um, robots are facilitating a transition of uh, our expertise and our skill set um, towards new arenas, right? And that for me is exciting. And, and yes, you might think, well, because now the, you know, when you go to a supermarket, um, then everything is automated. So then you don't need someone to be doing the ticketing, right? And that person is losing the job and probably not learning computer programming to, to develop new technology in that direction. But, you know, there will be many more areas that will emerge that we, we can't even imagine right now. Yeah? At the same time, I, I do um, believe in a, in a social economical change, uh, right? Um, and we've been discussing you know, for the last few years about uh, universal basic income that is uh, extremely connected to this issue. Right? So I think that you know the the, the human brain uh, can be much better used um, than in many of the of the jobs that we do. Right? Like many things we do are easily replaceable for um, um, a machine doing it. Right? Um, like especially rep repetitive jobs. You know? I, I don't think many people are, um, you know, happy in their everyday life, repeating the same task over and over and over and over again. Right. Um, but we are, I think by nature, um, we, we are a, a creative species, right? Um, so I think if, if we would manage to, to nail this transition, to be more efficient because we introduce um, automation much more because, because we use robots, because we can generate more wealth, right? Um, and, uh, and we use a part of that wealth uh, to establish a, a universal basic income so that you don't have to worry to make money. Like you, you don't have to find a nine to five job uh, repeating the same task over and over and over again. You know that you can you know, access a, um, a space for living uh, that, that you're going to eat tomorrow, right? Um, but if you want more, if you are more ambitious, but not only economically, but but also culturally, right? If, if you want to develop something, if you want to make a contribution to the world, the basics are covered, right? But the rest is up to you. Um, and the world is going to need evolution at a faster pace. And as we've generated in the last few years, I don't remember the data exactly, but in the, in the last two years, we've been generated like 20 times more data than in the previous 20 combined. I, I'm making up that, that number, right? But, that, but uh, we are exponentially growing in, in, in technology and, uh, and in, in, in the way we use it, we incorporate it to society. So, you know, there, there will be an, an insane future to discover. Right. And I think we need to, as a collective, 
um, you know, prepare society to embrace that and empower it, right? And perhaps or hopefully and uh, to to drive people to a, a, a much happier future when you know if you spend 80 percent of your of your time working right do something enjoyable that's what everyone dreams about you know? um i think the closer we get to that uh, reality uh, the more people ca that can uh, can achieve that dream the better off we are as a society uh, that's a really fascinating answer i i would i'm going to slightly uh, change direction here just based on the answer that you just gave us. When you think about yourself and the work that you're doing, do you look at yourself as still an architect, a technologist, a futurist, a, I, that term kind of makes me cringe, but um, you know, a designer, how, how do you look at what you're doing now? Or, are you, or do you just look at yourself as a, you know, I'm, I'm, just working in this world of problem solving for one specific thing that encompasses or brings in a lot of other aspects of the world that we live in now. I mean, how do you, how do you view your, what you're doing? Well, um, I think, um, uh, describing yourself into a category is becoming more and more difficult in, in this world today, I think. And that's a good thing. Um, like I'm, I'm an architect. I still consider myself an architect, um, even if yes, I work in technology or and and I'm an entrepreneur or I'm many things. But I will always be an architect. And I, but I think the 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 role of the architect changed and and it became more open. And and as the role of the of the architect, many other disciplines. No? Um, so I think today you can you can be a little bit of an architect, a little bit of a designer, a little bit of a technologist, a little bit of of an artist, right? And and those things together is what make your work unique, right? And and again, that that is not only applicable to to architecture, but actually to to most disciplines. Um, I do believe uh, in a in a kind of more a la carte uh, educational system. Um, like of course, there are there are the basics uh, that you need to cover, right? Like if you are an architect, you need to know a little bit of drawing, a little bit of mathematics, a little bit of etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Um, but um, I think like choosing specifically what you are interested in and how to make that a discipline, make that your discipline, right? And start making the steps uh, towards um, the world where you would like to operate, um, towards making a real contribution. Um, that makes it unique to you. I think that's actually essential in in academia as well. Uh, like we need to uh, start creating much more um, like in interdisciplinary and and much more kind of flexible systems uh, for you know studying and getting a degree and getting a job, right? But um, at the end of the day, you know, you, you study architecture, and I, I have students that that have ended up working in art, working in banks, right? Um, as computer programmers, programmers uh, data analysts, um, you know, filmmakers, right? Um, and I think that that's fascinating and, and we should probably acknowledge it and, and reinforce it, right? To give much more freedom to those who are interested in learning. So to answer your question shortly, um, I'm not sure what I am right now, but I like what I do. Hey, that's a great response. Um, man, well, speaking of interests, I would like to bring back, I know we've teased a little bit out on the sustainability partnerships and initiatives that Nagami um, has taken and made. Um, I'm just curious, what was the genesis of that? I mean, were you, as soon as you kind of did deep dive into 3D printing, oh, I, I love this technology, I want to pursue and push the limits of this technology. Were you already seeing plastics, knowing just the the nature of wastefulness and their impact on the environment? So did you already have sustainability in mind as soon as you started getting into 3D printing? Or is this something that happened maybe later when you shifted towards um you know, the start of Nagami, and then how did those partnerships come into place to where um, you are now partnering with, um, you know, ocean recycle plastic companies that um, help get you extrudable pellets or plastic that you can then um, feed through the robotics to get the furniture and design elements that, that you make? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's a, it's actually it's been very interesting for us to see the the evolution of uh, sustainability for the last last few years. I would say the last decade, but but it's especially the last very few years. No? Um, when we started, um, you know, yeah, sustainability was a thing. Um, yeah, you need to try to create things more sustainably and so on. But I don't think people realize that it, it, it just wasn't an option, right? It was a must. Like you, we really have to because otherwise we're in a countdown. Uh, like, like the world will end for, for sure, for real, if we uh, uh, keep on behaving the way we do, right? And uh, so I had that very, very clear, um, but you need to go in the steps, right? Uh, so when we started 3D printing, we, we started with PLA, um, that is a, a biodegradable material, right? So we avoided things like ABS, right? Like no way, super toxic, right? Um, and then, uh, uh, so we were working on, on with uh, PLA, but also mixing it up with uh, with virgin plastic, right? Because we we were trying to develop a robust technology. Um, our goal was always to jump very quickly to a hundred percent recycled plastic, which which we did, right? And I mean, still sometimes when you have like a huge structural requirement, you need to mix different plastics together, right? Uh, but now, as, as many other industries that are increasing the percentage of recycled plastic in their products, like, you know, um, brands like Ecoalf, right? Uh, that's a, a, a Spanish, incredibly fascinating um, clothing brand. <clears throat> it's 100% recycled plastic, right? Um, Adidas uh, with... Parley, right? Uh, they've been increasing the percentage of recycled plastic. And I think now, I believe they are at, at 50% and they are getting to 80% in a few years. Um, I think as the, the, the uh, clothing industry, right? Uh, and the fashion industry uh, is making an effort. Uh, we did have to make an effort in design long ago. Yeah. And especially in architecture, right? Like we use so many, like, polluting um, manufacturer, uh, manufacturing techniques and, and materials that we just need to stop because the effect that we will make uh, in architecture and construction is enormous, right? So we had that very uh, clearly in mind. And so then, then we started um, increasing the amount of recycled plastic. We, we started investigating with other plastics. Um, like then we arrived to PETG, that is the, the one we use the most. And then we mix it with uh, PET coming from plastic bottles and, and so on. And, and we keep a very clear direction in the way we evolve, uh, our, our technology. Uh, so when we first started, uh, it was very clear to us that we needed extruded that would work directly with pellets, right? not with filament like a, a, a small desktop 3D printers, right? Because we would avoid one step of transformation with the CO2 emissions that that implies. And and also we, we will reduce cost, right? Now we're working on a, a going one step earlier, uh, which is the, the flakes, right? Uh, when you, you, know, you clean out the material, separate it, and then uh, you chop it in small pieces, right? Uh, those are the flakes. Then you pelletize them. Um, so now we are actually uh, doing a few projects where we are starting printing with with flakes, right? Um, so I think slowly um, we are advancing a lot in in becoming much more sustainable to to the point that we all dream about, right? Which is you know we we take uh, plastic waste somewhere. You, you throw it in a robot and and then a chair pops out, right? We're still not there. You just hit play, oh, right? Play. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Manuel, you have Nagami, which is your design slash 3D printing company, and then you have Mad M Design. What, tell us a little bit about that company. Mm -hmm. uh, well, so Mad M Design uh, was a company created uh, back in... 2011, right? Um, and he was working on um, uh, digital processes for, for design, architecture, animation, and, and so on, right? Uh, so we developed uh, uh, projects not only in the domain of architecture, where we were doing you know, um, experimental pavilions, like uh, dealing with 
um, bamboo uh, bent with robots and, and uh, um, fiberglass, um, making extract, uh, structures that would be bent inactive and, and that would make architecture like um, flat packable and, and easily deployable. <clears throat> And, and we were experimenting with the different kind of spaces, but at the same time, also seeing how to materialize data in different ways, right? And sometimes that ended up being uh, animations. Uh, sometimes will become uh, physical forms, like the um, uh, the project we recently did um, with uh, with Glenfiddich, right? Uh, where we we take weather data and uh, and transform it into a cage that is embedding that data within it. Um, so uh, let's say modern design is the more um, kind of, I mean, free and exploratory um, uh, design um, company or, or framework, right? Where I don't have to necessarily work with 3D printing only, but I can explore other projects that are more abstract or that work in different directions, um, keeping, you know, the core of what, what matters to me, right? Which, uh, you know, is like, technology and sustainability, right? Um, and, and that goes channels through uh, digital digital design. So and to be honest, it's also right now uh, because we're incredibly busy in Nagami and Nagami is, is uh, growing rapidly. Um, you know, modern design became just kind of like my little space uh, when I go, when I want to have a, a break from 3D printing, <laughs> right? And uh, and I think it's good that it's, it stays there for a bit. Um, it keep, keeps keeps on rolling, right? It's it's good for me to know that I have I have that little cabin to go to on on Sunday afternoon, <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, the Nagami is just um, you know eating more and more uh, of my energy. That's really funny that uh, you would describe that other company as the explorative solution for your mind and kind of where you're going with things. Cause I just think it's funny that in my opinion, Nagami is also that. So it's just interesting <laughs> to see kind of where your, your head goes in um, these different directions. Yes, no, it, it is. And uh, that, that's an interesting thing, but you know, Nagami was, you know, we're, we're a company, we need to be profitable, right. And, and we work a lot on efficiency, even if it's, of course, incredibly exploratory. I could say that 80% of our work uh, is research and development, right? But we need to deal with, you know, budgets and, and timelines and, you know, things that, that, that you need to deal with when you, when you have a, a company that becomes real, right? Um, modern design is way more flexible, right? Of course, this is still, you know, timelines and budgets and, and so on. But but it it is slightly more fluid. It has it has less pressure in many of those aspects because it is not a manufacturing company, and and that is fundamentally different. But yes, I, I'm I consider myself incredibly lucky that uh, all the hats I wear um, are incredibly creative and and that I take them on with passion. Very interesting, Manuel. So um, knowing that this podcast is going to air and uh, get an audience of a lot of people in the industry and in the field, um, namely architects and interior designers. I'm just curious from being in the architectural background in space, transitioning to digital fabrication and really pioneering um, that computational design, its effects and how it shapes the industry. Is there anything with this audience in mind that you would just kind of leave them with or charge them with, you know, is it like just 3d print more or is there other things that you'd, you'd like to say? Definitely 3D print more. <laughs> That's the first thing I would say. Um, now I would just say that uh, I, I think we need to enjoy this moment. I think it's, it's an incredibly fascinating moment for, for design and architecture. Like a few years ago, uh, we, were, we were the ones like drawing a line and then giving it to a manufacturer um, to kind of take on that work from there and make their own interpretations and, and, and then make it a reality on their way. Right, and and that is something that kind of made the the, the evolution of a, of construction uh, a little bit slower, right? Like manufacturers are normally used to do things in a certain way. Some of them take more risk, some of them don't, right? Uh, but there are a lot of factors involved in that process, and and when you go with a crazy idea, sometimes you need to make it yourself first and demonstrate that that's possible. 
so that they can also embrace it and, and push it even farther, right? And that is um, uh, a spirit that some of, some of the some of the architects from the from the sixties uh, were were taking. No? Like uh, Jean Prouvé um, was an architect who 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 had you know the, their own uh, I mean he, his own uh, way of making, right? So he became the architect, the builder, and the distributor. Right or in Spain, Miguel Fisac, right, um, who was the only one that that could actually, you know, convince someone to use a piece of fabric to pour concrete on. Right, he invented something called the, the soft concrete, you know, that now is called fabric formwork. Right, and, and he was implementing it in buildings because he was the one doing the prototyping. Yeah, he was the one liaising with a with a concrete company to make those experiments. But but he took that risk on and then translated that risk into industry once things were already emerging. Right now, um, we we are not only having uh, machines to prototype our ideas to make models to then give someone else to interpret and and make them in a different materials. We start having machines to produce not the models, but actually the prototypes or the mock-ups of uh, that part of the building yeah, in-house and, and investigating what is the technology that would make them a reality. So we go to the manufacturer, not with a set of plans and sections, but actually with a real object that they can, they can touch and they can feel and they can understand how to make it or repeat it, right, to implement in a building. Um, some of us also <laughs> start to take that, that even farther you know, and become the manufacturers themselves, right? Um, so I think the way the, 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 the boundaries between uh, design and manufacturing or between the architect and the contractor start to blend, right? New opportunities for incredibly novel uh, design techniques uh, are to emerge, right? And, and that is incredible. And it's, also, uh, it's only going to get better. So I would say, you know, for, for an architect, for, for a designer, for anyone working in this discipline, just, you know, stay curious and, and creative and push for your ideas to, to, to become a reality. And if no one wants to do it for you, <laughs> then do it yourself, right? Um, because then others will uh, want to follow that path or to accompany you on, on that journey. And that is, uh, for me, incredibly beautiful for, for our profession. So one of the questions we had here, Manuel, was, you know, when you go through creative dry spells, where do you go for inspiration? But it sounds more like you never have creative dry spells. Um, and you go from your design company at Nagami, your 3D printing design company at Nagami to your other design company to get away from that. And you're always creating. How many hours of sleep are you getting a night? Do you actually sleep? Or are you just always on the move going a million miles a minute? I have insomnia right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that oh, has, right. He is a robot. <laughs> I am. I am an actual robot. Um, no, I mean it's just uh, it, it's not. It's not just myself, right? And uh, and that is what makes it special. So I have uh, at Nagami. I have uh, two amazing partners who are the ones that are controlling production, who are in the factory, who are developing the technology, right? Like um, I am. You know, I'm the one with the with the kind of nerdiness to to make that code a reality, right? With with a passion about design and who drives the the kind of design atmosphere of the of the company and and also try to transmit this passion to um, possible clients or collaborators so that they they embrace it and, and walk with me in that journey, right? Um, then there is of course a lot of all the work that I that I have to do, um, that is also creative. No? Like I mean, for me as an architect, being an, an entrepreneur is, is something completely new. I'm learning a lot of you know business and how to deal with spreadsheets, which I I couldn't even imagine could be a creative process. And and somehow because of the nature of the projects that we do, it, it does become incredibly creative. Um, so. 
it's true that my my day uh, is is always a little bit strange because yes, I can jump from a you know an, a, a board meeting uh, to a, a, a spreadsheet about uh, preparing the expansion of the company to open Maya and design something to then uh, meet with my guys and and see how to push a project further uh, to many other things that actually change every day as well. Um, but um, because uh, because I I never wanted to be stuck in in something that in a task that repeats over and over and over that keeps me alive. Um, you know that's probably why I don't sleep that much because I I wanna I wanna be <laughs> alive as much as I can. Um, not sure, but um, I think um, like being being lucky enough. Uh, to enjoy most of the work you do and most of the hours in, in your day uh, is something that you can't take for granted. Uh, so I try to push it every day when I wake up and go to bed very late <laughs> and knowing that uh, it's been uh, an enjoyable day and, and that tomorrow will be different and probably more enjoyable. So, yeah. Well, that's very cool. That's very cool. cool. Well, I want to say a big thank you uh, for joining us today on The Square. This has been an incredibly interesting episode. I feel like we could do a weekly podcast just with you alone because uh, I think there's another 10 to 12 hours worth of material here if we uh, do a real deep dive. So thank you for your time, Manuel. This has been fascinating, and we're going to look forward to a live session coming up next with questions from the audience. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Looking forward to that session.